Hello, my name is Stephen Murray. Welcome to Bloom's Day, presented by Irish Network Minnesota. When James Joyce began writing Ulysses in 1914, he could not have foreseen the massive, massive changes that would occur before its completion. The year 1914 would see the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand and the beginning of World War I. 1916 would see the Easter Rising and the War for Irish Independence, a global pandemic in 1918. 1921 saw the formation of the Irish Free State and the beginning of the Irish Civil War. Massive, massive changes in the eight-year period resulted in a novel that would change English language literature forever. We too have seen tremendous change. In a normal year, we'd all be gathered at Summit Manor today, but we are lucky to have tremendous technology, so we gather virtually. But before we dive into that novel that changed the world, let's get the show started with some music. Our first guest has been representing his Irish roots by playing music on the Twin Cities Irish scenes for over 20 years. As a founding member of St. Paul's favorite Irish band, Paddy Wagon, he's performed all over the country and all over the world. Irish Network Minnesota is a social, cultural, and business network for Friends of Ireland. Irish Network Minnesota is part of a growing national network in the United States and Ireland of more than 20 chapters from New York to San Diego under the umbrella Irish Network USA. The chapters include more than 4,500 members with 500 events held annually. An Irish Network membership connects you to members all over the United States and Ireland. 
For more information, please visit irishnetworkmn.org. And while you're there, please consider becoming a member or making a donation to help support more events like this. Now, it wouldn't be Bloomsday without a reading from Ulysses. At Bloomsday celebrations around the world, people gather together, dress up, and read portions of the novel out loud. It is my special pleasure to present the Irish ambassador to the US, Ambassador Daniel Mulhall, to get the ball rolling. I want to send my greetings to the Minnesota Irish Network on the occasion of uh, Bloomsday 2021. This is the 99th year since um, Ulysses was published in February of, of uh, 1922 and next year will be a big celebration of the centenary of that great novel, that great Irish contribution to world literature uh, through the pen of James Joyce. Um, I'm very glad that the Minnesota Irish Network is uh, um, organizing this Bloomsday celebration because I, I think it's a, it's a very good thing because it, um, it, it uh, plays to one of the strengths of Ireland, which is our very uh, rich literary heritage through James Joyce, W.B. Yeats, Oscar Wilde, George Bernard Shaw, I could go on down to Seamus Heaney and the writers of today, Colin Tobin and Colin McCann and so forth. But um, the great thing about um, James Joyce's Ulysses is, is that it's a novel about everyday life. It's a novel, of course, loosely based on home was Odyssey, but the heroes of this uh, book are very much ordinary people, Dubliners like Leopold Bloom. And I'm going to read a passage from the Calypso episode, episode four of, of um, James Joyce's Ulysses. And I'm reading this because the one of the greatest characters in world literature is Leopold Bloom, uh, the, um, the main character in Joyce's Ulysses. And this is a great achievement on Joyce's part to create this very uh, interesting, um, complex uh, character. And we get to know Bloom in a way that few other characters have been known throughout the history of literature because we, we, we enter into Bloom's mind throughout the pages of Joyce's great novel. And this is where we first encounter Leopold Bloom. The first three episodes of Ulysses are devoted to uh, one of the minor characters or one of the lesser characters of Ulysses, which is Stephen Dedalus, based on James Joyce himself, a young writer. But Leopold Bloom is an advertising salesman. His marriage is not doing too well. His wife's unfaithful to him. And he's not that successful in his professional life either. But he somehow manages to come through a day of trials and tribulations uh, in his wanderings around Dublin, which is at the heart of Ulysses. So here is where we first meet Leopold Bloom. Mr. Leopold Bloom ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. He liked thick giblet soup, nutty gizzards, a stuffed roast heart, liver slices filled with crust crumbs, fried hen cods rolls. Most of all, he liked grilled mutton kidneys, which gave to his palate a fine tang of saintly fended, scented urine. Kidneys were in his mind as he moved about the kitchen, softly writing her breakfast things on the humpy tray. Gelid light and air were in the kitchen, but out of doors, gentle summer morning everywhere. 
made him feel a bit peckish. The coals were reddening. Another slice of bread and butter. Three, four, right? She didn't like her plate full, right? He turned from the tray, lifted the kettle off the hob and set it sideways on the fire. It sat there, dull and squat. Its spout stuck out. Cup of tea soon. Good. Mouth dry. The cat walked stiffly round a leg of the table, with tail on high. Meow. Oh, there you are, Bloom said, turning from the fire. The cat mewed in answer and stalked around stiffly, round a leg of the table, mewing. Just how she stalks over my writing table. Purr. Scratch my head. Purr. Mr. Bloom watched curiously, kindly, the lithe black form. Clean to see. The gloss of her sleek hide, the white button under the butt of her tail, the green flashing eyes. He bent down to her, his hands on his knees. Milk for the pussins, he said. Meow, the cat cried. They call him stupid. They understand what we say better than we understand them. She understands all she wants to. Vindictive too. Wonder what I look like to her. Height of a tower. No, she can jump me. Afraid of the chickens, is she? He said mockingly. Afraid of the chook chooks. I never saw such a stupid pussins as the pussins. Cruel nature. Curious, mice never squeal. Seem to like it. Meow, the cat said loudly. She blinked up out of her avid, shame-closing eyes, mewing plaintively and long, showing him her milk-white teeth. He watched the dark eye slits, narrowing with greed till her eyes were green stones. Then he went to the dresser, took the jug Hanlon's milkman had just filled for him, poured warm bubble milk on a saucer and set it slowly on the floor. Rrr! She cried, running to lap. He watched the bristles shining warily in the weak light as she tipped three times and licked lightly. Wonder is it true if you clip them they can't mouse after? Why? They shine in the dark. Perhaps the tips. Or kind of feelers in the dark, perhaps. He listened to her licking lap. Ham and eggs, no. No good eggs with this drought. Want pure fresh water. Thursday. Not a day either for a mutton kidney at Buckley's. Fried with butter, a shake of pepper. Better a pork kidney at Glugash's while the kettle is boiling. She laps slower, then licking the saucer clean. Why are their tongues so rough? To lap better, all porous holes. Nothing she can eat. He glanced around him. No. On quietly creaky boots, he went up the staircase to the hall, paused by the bedroom door. She might like something tasty, thin bread and butter she likes in the morning. Still perhaps, once in a way, he said softly in the bare hall, I'm going round the corner, be back in a minute. And when he heard his voice say it, he added, you don't want anything for breakfast. A sleepy grunt answered, no, no. She did not want anything. It's approximately 22 hours to read Ulysses out loud in its entirety. We're not going to put you through all that, but we have prepared another selection from the sixth chapter of the book. It's probably not the most joyous section, but it deals with themes that are relevant to our current moment. 
Not only is there a focus on death, it is also one of the chapters that highlights the anti-Semitism towards the Jewish bloom. There is also the book's one reference to pandemics, which would have been on Joyce's mind, having just lived through the 1918 Spanish influenza. So without further ado, here is the Hades episode from Ulysses. Martin Cunningham first poked his silk-hatted head into the creaking carriage and entering deftly, seated himself. In the sixth section of the book, Leopold Bloom attends the funeral of his friend, Patty Dignam. Mr. Power stepped in after him, curving his height with care. Come on. After you. Yes, yes, yes. Mr. Daedalus covered himself quickly and got in. Are we all here now? Come along, Bloom. Mr. Bloom entered and sat in the vacant place. He pulled the door to after him and slammed it twice till it shut tight. As Bloom rides through the streets of Dublin in a carriage to the cemetery, he speaks with his friends and reflects on life and death. A jolt. Their carriage began to move, creaking and swaying. What way is he taking us? Irish Town, Ringsend, Brunswick Street. That's a fine old custom. I'm glad to see it has not died out yet. On the tram tracks near Watery Lane, they pass Stephen Daedalus, the other protagonist of the novel, and Simon Daedalus's son. There's a friend of yours, gone boy, Daedalus. Who is that? Your son and heir. Was that Mulligan cad with him? No, 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 he was alone. Mr. Bloom smiled joylessly on Rings End Road. He's in with a low down crowd. His name stinks all over Dublin. I'll tickle his catastrophe to believe you me. Noisy self-willed man, full of his son. He's right. Something to hand on. If little Rudy had lived, see him grow up, hear his voice in the house, my son. Me in his eyes. Strange feeling it would have been just a chance how life begins. As they drive, they pass the monuments of Dublin, giving the reader a road map of their path. I could have helped him on in life. I could make him independent. St. Mark's, the Queen's Theatre, Daughter Bridge, the ripped up roadway before the tenement houses. Gas works, whooping cough they say it cures. Good thing Millie never got it. Poor children, doubles them up black and blue in convulsions. A raindrop spat on his hat. He drew back and saw an instant of shower spray dots over the gray flags. Got off lightly with illnesses compared, only measles, flaxseed tea, scarlatina, influenza epidemics, canvassing for death. They passed Nelson's pillar. Dignam was as decent a little man as ever wore a hat. He went very suddenly. Breakdown. Heart. He had a sudden death, poor fellow. The best death. No suffering. A moment and all is over, like dying in sleep. In the midst of life. But the worst of all is the man who takes his own life. The greatest disgrace to have in the family. Temporary insanity, of course. We must take a charitable view of it. They say a man who does it is a coward. It is not for us to judge. Mr. Bloom, about to speak, closed his lips again. Martin Cunningham's large eyes looking away now. He knows, rattles his bones. Sympathetic man he is, intelligent. Always a good word to say. They have no mercy on that here. Refuse Christian burial. The carriage rattled swiftly along Blessington Street over the stones. They used to drive a stake of wood through his heart in the grave, as if it wasn't broken already, found in the riverbed clutching rushes. Yet, sometimes they repent too late. As they turned into Beakley Street, a street organ sent over and after them a rollicking, rattling song of the halls. That afternoon of the inquest, 
the red labeled bottle on the table, the room in the hotel with hunting pictures, stuffy it was. Sunlight through the slots of the Venetian blind, the coroner's sunlit ears, big and hairy, boots giving evidence. We're going the pace, I think. God grant the driver doesn't upset us in the road. In silence, they drove along Fibsboro Road. An empty hearse trotted by, coming from the cemetery. Thought he was asleep first, then saw like yellow streaks on his face, had slipped down to the foot of the bed. Dumphy's Corner. Morning coaches drawn up, drowning their grief. Tip top position for a pub. Expect we'll pull up here on the way back to drink his health. Pass round the consolation, elixir of life. The high railings of Prospect Cemetery rippled past their gaze. Dark poplars, rare white forms. Verdict, overdose. Death by misadventure. The letter for my son Leopold. No more pain, wake no more, nobody owns. The horse harshed against the curbstone stopped. Martin Cunningham wrenched back the handle and shoved the door open with his knee. He stepped out. His companions followed. Often now got here before us. Must be 20 or 30 funerals every day. Then Mount Jerome for the Protestants. Mourners came through the gates. The mutes shouldered the coffin and bore it in. Funerals all over the world, everywhere, every minute. Shoveling them under by the cartload, double quick. Thousands every hour. Too many in the world. I was in mortal agony with you talking of suicide before Bloom. What? How so? His father poisoned himself. Oh, God. First I heard of it. Poisoned himself? Bloom looked down at the boots he had blacked and polished. How many children did Doignan have? Boy, Ned Lambert says he'll try to get one of the girls employed at Todd's. <laughs> A sad case. <laughs> Five young children. A great blow to the poor wife. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. She had outlived him, lost her husband. One must outlive the other. Condole with her. Your terrible loss. She would marry another. No, uh, yet who knows after. They enter the mausoleum where the priest performs the service. Bloom's thoughts wander, reflecting on the meaning of the Catholic rite and on death itself. Broken heart, a pump after all pumping, thousands of gallons of blood every day. One fine day it gets bunged up and there you are. Lots of them lying around here. Lungs, hearts, livers, old rusty pumps. The resurrection and the life. Once you're dead, you're dead. The coffin dived out of sight, eased down by the men straddled on the grave trestles. Begin to be forgotten. Out of sight, out of mind. A seventh grave digger came beside Mr. Bloom to take up an idle spade. Clay, brown, damp, began to be seen in the hole. It rose nearly over. Let us go round by O'Connell's grave. We have time. Most. Some say he's not in that grave at all, that the coffin was filled with stones, that one day he will come again. Parnell will never come again. He's there, all that was mortal of him. Peace to his ashes. He's at rest in the middle of his people, old Dano. How many broken hearts are buried here, Simon? Mr. Bloom walked, unheeded by saddened angels, crosses, broken pillars, family vaults, Stone hopes praying with upcast eyes. We're sensible to spend the money on some charity for the living. Pray for the repose of the soul of. Does anybody really? Plant him and have done with him. An obese gray rat toddled along the side of a crypt, moving mm -hmm. pebbles. An old stager. He knows the ropes. One of those chaps would make short work of a fellow. Pick the bones clean no matter who it was. Ordinary meat for them. A corpse is meat gone bad. Cremation better. Priests dead against it. Time of the plague. Quick lime fever pits to eat them. Ashes to ashes. The gates glimmered in front, still open. Uh, back to the world again. 
enough of this place. Brings you a bit nearer every time. Plenty to see and hear and feel yet. A solicitor, John Henry Minton, emerged from a side path with a ding in the side of his hat. Excuse me, sir. Your hat is a little crushed. John Henry Minton stared at him for an instant without moving. Right there. John Henry Minton took off his hat, bulged out the ding, and smoothed the nap with care on his coat sleeve. He kept, clapped the hat on his head again. It's all right now. John Henry Minton jerked his head down in acknowledgement. They walked on toward the gates. Oyster eyes. Ah, never mind. Be sorry after, perhaps. Thank you. How grand we are this morning. The Irish are no strangers to hunger. With one in eight Minnesotans struggling to put food on the table, Irish Network Minnesota has joined a nationwide effort to encourage food and monetary donations. We started March Out Hunger to help people in our community. We focus on the month of March with food drives, donation boxes, and collections during the St. Paul St. Patrick's Day Parade. This year, we collected over 435 pounds of food for Neighborhood House and $115 supporting Minnesota Food Share. For more information and to support struggling Minnesotans, please visit mnfoodshare.org.
And now I'd like to introduce the president of Irish Network Minnesota, Mary McFarland Brooks, for a Bloomsday greeting and to present the inaugural Irish Network Minnesota Bloomsday Literary Award. As Irish Network Minnesota celebrates our fourth Bloomsday celebration, I want to thank all of our great partners that have gotten us to this point. Summit Manor Wedding and Event Venue, Finnegan's, the Ancient Order of Hibernians, John Ireland Division 4, the Dubliner Pub, Extended Exposure, and Irish Gazette Media. An important piece of InMen's mission is to celebrate the Irish culture and how that culture has impacted the world. For example, Irishman James Joyce's novel Ulysses is the only worldwide celebration of a book. I'm Mary McFarland, and along with the Irish Network Minnesota Board, welcome you to our first virtual Bloomsday. We owe huge thanks to playwright and director Stephen Murray, who reimagined a virtual Bloomsday for this year and made it happen. We want to thank our local and national readers, Sean Ewert from California, Dan Gleason from Minnesota, Terry Harden from Illinois, John Heiberger from California, Kathy Luby from Minnesota, Paul Miller from Illinois, and Eddie Owens from Minnesota. Also, a big thanks to the Irish ambassador to the U.S., Dan Mulhall, for his contribution to our Bloomsday event. Also, in keeping with our theme of, theme of celebrating books and writers in 2021, for the first time in our history, we are introducing the Irish Network Minnesota Bloomsday Literary Award that moving forward will be presented annually at this event to local writers who by their work enlarge our perspective of the world. We are delighted to have as our first recipient the extraordinarily talented, internationally known and locally based poet, Ethna McKiernan, who will be accepting the award virtually. McKiernan has twice been awarded the Minnesota State Art Board Grant and was nominated for the Minnesota Book Award for her first book, Caravan. Her work has been anthologized in the Notre Dame Book of Irish American Poetry, 33 Minnesota Poets, and in many more publications. Her other books include Sky Thick with Fireflies and Swimming with Shadows. She has a new book of poetry just out this month, Light Slowly Rolling Backwards, New and Selected Poems. Look for it on Amazon or at local bookstores. McKiernan also owned and managed Irish Books and Media, the premier worldwide resource for Irish books, manuscripts, and other media from 1977 to 2007. She is the daughter of Owen McKiernan, internationally recognized Irish studies scholar and founder of the Irish American Cultural Institute. He is credited with reviving and preserving Irish culture and language in the U.S. We appreciate you joining us for what we hope is our first and last virtual Blooms Day and we look forward to seeing you in person at next year's Bloomsday celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Mary McFarland, for your kind words. On this first virtual Bloomsday and the fourth Bloomsday celebration, we applaud the playwright Stephen Murray for bringing Joyce's Ulysses to life. And we applaud the many who worked to make this promotion happen. I'm honored to be the first recipient of the Irish Network 2021 Bloomsday Literary Award. I think the best I can do is read a poem or two. Both my maternal grandparents came from Cork, West Cork, and Fermoy. My mother's, my father's mother came from La Hinch County Clare and his father's family from Cavan. Here are two poems written for my maternal grandmother from Cork and for my paternal grandmother from Clare. Note that the one for my Cork grandmother was written in the 1980s and the one for my Clare mother, Clare grandmother was written in 2018. Going back. Here, it must be where you stood, one hand raised to shade your eyes against the harsh Atlantic, grinding shoulders with the rocks below. 
how your skirt cut the wind in half, and how you waited, brooding for the boats that stitched their slow way in, with ribboned wakes a deeper green, and each new ship a promise that you couldn't keep. I see the girl you were, back walk back alone to her father's house, caught between two hungers. Some absent strain of music kept you restless, and I know how the longing worked on you, for even at night, the boat sent out a siren tongue, foreign to your ear, perhaps, but song. One day you finally left, sailing your boat straight into the cave of America's open arms, feeling the wind no monster there after such lean dreams as you had culled from Irish soil. Mama Moore, I stand here now where you once stood, the unchanged land beneath my feet, certain that my bones were formed from that same air that made your bones first stir. But the old heritage breeds a different pain in me, a stranger to both countries. I cannot make my roots take cold, can only stand and hear this sea return the poems that you've willed it as a child, while the wind raises ghosts behind me. And for my Nana of La Hinge, <clears throat> our, our ancestral ghosts. The tall shadow from the roof at Sheehan forms the dark V across the lawn lit with stars behind the house belonging to my brother Fergus. <coughs> Calm settles like a sigh upon the town below and a low wind forms a scrim upon the surface of Loch Derg, a half mile beneath this house. I have come to see the yellow gorse of County Clare, where my grandmother was born, the rocky landscape past the burren that leads straight to the sea. The fuchsia studied the fuchsia studied, sorry, the fuchsia studied fox glove dusted hills. She walked before she left for New York. Look, see how this house holds a part of her, holds my brother's fiddle music as it echoes through the catch kitchen at Sheehan each night, reaching back from the future to her ears while she stands and stares at the sea, humming to herself a forward tune. See how we hold our ghosts of history here. Well, that's our show. Congratulations to Ethna McKiernan. Thank you to Tim Flynn for performing on the guitar. A special thanks to Ambassador Mulhall and his staff. Thank you to our Bloomsday readers, Eddie Owens, Kathy Luby, Dan Gleason, Kerry Hardin, Paul Miller, John Heiberger, and Sean Ewart. Don't forget to check out irishnetworkmn.org for more events like this. And thank you so much for coming out tonight. We'll be back together at Irish Fair, so look for us at the info booth, stop by and say hi. Now, it wouldn't be Bloomsday unless Kathy Luby sang the parting glass. So let's all raise a glass and drink a toast to next year when we can be back together again. From all of us at Irish Network, good night.
of all the money that e'er I spent, I spent it in good company. And all the harm that e'er I done, alas, it was to none but me. And all I done for want of wit, to memory now I can't recall. So fill to me the parting glass. Good night and joy be with you all. Oh, all the comrades that e'er I had are sorry for my going away. And all the sweethearts that e'er I had would wish me one more day to stay. But since it falls unto my lot that I should rise and you should not, I'll gently rise and I'll softly call Good night and joy be with you.